Hey guys, it's possible for anybody to get sober on their own, okay? I got sober without going to rehab and I was hopeless. I was hopeless, um, alcoholic and drug addict. And um, it just takes willingness. So if you've got the willingness um, and you're sick of living that shitty life, maybe you're doing fentanyl, maybe you're doing coke, maybe you're just drinking like a fish, um, I've done it all. And well, not all of it. I haven't done fentanyl, um, but I've, I've kicked opiates before and um, they're a bitch. So you got to be prepared. You got to be prepared, uh, plan out like the two weeks of being on the couch, get some movies, um, some good junk food, and you're going to be sick for at least a couple weeks. You know, it'll feel like you got the flu. And the problem, the, the, the real problem is it's not, I mean, anybody can be physically ill, right? You might feel like you're going to die, but you're not. You'll get through it, right? Um, you just got to nut it up and do it if you want to get sober. It's this. This will trick you in a million different ways why to, why to stop, uh, why you don't need to be sober. And you got you to gotta look out for those. You know, um, I'm too miserable. You know, it'll tell you, this is too miserable. I can't do this. Bullshit. You can do it. You know, uh, it'll tell you all kinds of different things. Um, mine used to tell me, you know, most everybody's using drugs anyways. I mean, it's, it's no big deal. Or what would happen? This is, this was the big one for me. I would get like three or four days under my belt. And this would start screaming at me. You have fucked your life up so bad. It's going to be impossible to get back. It's going to be impossible. You're going to be able to fuck up your whole life. And maybe, I don't know. Um, but I'll tell you what. The last time around, I didn't listen to this fucking thing. I, I used prayer and I went to a lot of meetings. I went to a lot of AA meetings. I didn't like it. I did not like going at first. And my first uh, group of AA meetings I went to was in uh, Austin, Texas. It's a place called the Little Pink House. And I was like, uh, you know what? I don't, I don't have anything in common with all these little liberals in here and um, with purple hair and wearing earrings through their nose and face and all that shit. I've got nothing in common with these people. And that's my head. That's another scenario that your head wants to separate you from everybody else. And where does that leave you? Alone with this. This will break you down. You have to get out of this. And the way you do is with other people trying to do the same thing that you're doing. And um, so I was in those, going to those meetings and there was atheists in there and I'm like, how can an atheist possibly get sober? Well, one of them's got 41 years and another one's got like 26 years. So, and I know them well, they're good people. They carry a solid message. And uh, that's not how I do it, right? But I don't need to judge them and their program and how they do it. See, that's just this thing trying to get me, separate me from everybody else. Makes me, di you different from me and, uh, that way, um, I'm alone and lonely and uh, a drink sounds pretty good when you're alone and depressed, right? A drug sounds pretty good when you're alone and depressed and don't have any friends. So, you know, you're going to have to do some things that you don't want to do, okay? Um, whether that's an AA program, whether that's a spiritual church program, but you're going to have to do some things that are uncomfortable to you. Um, it was not comfortable for me to raise my hand. My name is Gary. I'm an alcoholic and I'm, I'm, I relapsed and I had 10 years sober and now I'm a fucking loser and a, uh, a newcomer, right? That's how my head wanted to tell me. And again, separate me from everybody else. The thing with that meeting is I started that meeting. I was going to meetings in California and then I went to, I, I moved to Austin, Texas and I went to some new meetings in Austin. And I found this little pink house on Bolden Avenue. It's called the Pink House. And it's a 45-year-old meeting, maybe 50-year-old meeting. And a lot of people have gotten sober there. Um, a lot of rock stars and famous people and stuff like that. So, uh, and at any given day, you could see somebody in there, right? I'm not saying any names or anything like that. But at any given day, 
you can see quite a few uh, people that you might know in there. But I'm, I'm, I'm judging the hell out of these people. And then uh, I, I had shared in a meeting, uh, I'm, I'm afraid for my son. He hasn't answered his phone. He's uh, a heroin addict. He's in Long Beach right now, which is a dangerous place for him to be. And I raised, or uh, I said, I'm afraid. Um, and then I went home that night. Okay. And uh, I prayed because I was scared shitless, man. He wasn't answering his phone. That was very unlike him. And I prayed and prayed. It was the longest I had ever been in prayer. Maybe a half hour, maybe longer, maybe an hour. I don't, I don't remember, but it was a long, I remember being in prayer for a long time and going, man, you were, you were in prayer for a long time. Then I started to doze off and then my, uh, I heard a knock on my door. I run to the front door. It's my, my oldest son. And he said, uh, Brandon's gone. And I just, I lost it, man. Um, then I flew to California and uh, identified his body in Long Beach, the Long Beach coroner's office. Then I jumped a plane back to Austin. I didn't even know how I did it. My faith in God is how I did it. But I jumped a plane back to Austin and that next day I was in that meeting and I shared in that meeting with all the fucking weirdos, right? All the people that I wanted to separate myself from. And I'm sh I shared uh, how I lost my son to fentanyl. And I was weeping. And I looked up after I was done sharing. And there wasn't a dry eye in the room. Everybody else felt my pain. Everybody else in that room, all the fucking weirdos and all the atheists and all those people that I just wanted to say are a bunch of fucking weirdos and atheists. All those people felt my pain, felt how much I loved my son and felt what I was going through. And I'm sure they saw a guy suffering in a lot of pain, not wanting to take a drink, not wanting to do a drug. And um, that's what I was. Um, I wasn't struggling to stay sober, but uh, I knew I was in danger. I knew I was in danger if I got alone too long with this. And I started so many bonds after that meeting with those people. And I was just there uh, Thanksgiving and saw them. I was, I was there in, in uh, I was just in Austin, Texas a couple days ago for Christmas, but I, uh, dinner was scheduled at the time of that meeting and I, I couldn't, I couldn't make the meeting, but, um, I was there for Thanksgiving and I had, li uh, absolute joy in my heart to see some of those people and, um, and they had it for me too. Right. Um, because I would share, I, you know, you, I, I, I would share exactly what I just told you guys, right? Uh, I thought you guys were just a bunch of atheists and shit like that. And then put your arms around me when my son died and, and when I was in pain. And um, that's what you get in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, there's, they're not all perfect and they're not all, nobody's perfect. And there, there's a lot of weirdos um, everywhere, right? You'll get a weirdo everywhere. But as a whole, man, I wouldn't do it any other way. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Crystal Meth Anonymous, all of that stuff, man, is if you're getting sober on your own, uh, you, you, you strengthen your chances tenfold, twentyfold, right? If you go to meetings and you work steps and you read from my little bookie wookie, my book. I cuddle up to this thing at night, man. The pages are yellow. I've had it a long time. Bindings are starting to rip. And it brings me comfort. It's brought me so much comfort and joy in my life. There's not a problem that I've, that I've come across in my life. I mean, I've been 57 years old. I've been in AA since I was like 22 years old, 18 years old. There, there's not a problem that I haven't come across in, in, in life that is, the solution is not in this book. I swear to you, I swear to God, the solution's in here. And I'm reminded very often that the solution is never has anything to do with the problem. The solution is always spiritual. So when you're in a pinch, when your ass is in a ringer, you go to God. Don't know how it works, but it works. You know, God, uh, this is too big for me, man. Like when I lost my son, I was 
I mean, how, this is way, this is too much on my heart, man. This is, this is too much to deal with. How, how am I going to get through life without my son? This is way too much for me. And he eased that pain. And I would get thoughts like, throw yourself into service with others. Make a video. Talk about your pain. I would get thoughts like that. It wasn't some lightning bolt with some guy with a staff and a robe going, make a video. It was just thoughts of that. And, and it's an inner voice. And it says in this book where to find that God. You know? And um, it tells us deep down within us. And in the last analysis, it is only there he can be found. In the last analysis. So you got to, when you're, when you're getting ready to get sober, you're going to have to dig deep down inside and find that power greater than yourself. And he's in there. He's in there. He gives us the fight, man. He gives us the, the stones to, to conquer this thing. Couldn't do it without prayer. I could not do this without a, a faith in a higher power who I choose to call God, Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to get into my religion and all that stuff, but you know, when I got sober, I, you know, I was on the fence with the whole Christianity thing. And, and I've just kind of gotten back, the longer I've been sober, the, you know, I've gotten back to the Catholic Church. And um, I don't go to church every weekend, but I go to church. I go to Catholic Mass. And, um, you know, it's what's comfortable to me. It's familiar to me. And it's a way to worship God. I think that the, the nuts and bolts of it is, is in the steps. And God is all over those steps. You're going to bump into God if you walk in the steps, man. You're just going to, you're going to have to. And for those atheists and um, people who don't believe, well, there's a lot of powers greater than yourself. And the meetings are one. You know, when you're, I don't know, if, you know, every time, and I, and I was in a meeting over there on Thanksgiving. I, not every time I'm in a meeting, but there's some meetings that are just special. And the Pink House in Austin, Texas is a special place for me. It's like a spiritual movement going on in that place at 5.30 p.m. And, it, you know, there's, you know, it's an AA meeting. You're supposed to talk about alcohol only. People talk about whatever the fuck they want to talk about, you know, whether it's sex addiction. Um, I've heard everything. Heroin addiction, um, meth, fentanyl. Nobody says, hey, you need to only talk about alcohol. It's a real liberal kind of place, man. And there's some cool characters in that place. So, and the pillars in the room are <laughs> this, the, this strong sobriety, like two men with 60 or 70 years of sobriety between them. They're, uh, they're atheists. <laughs> so go figure. But like I said, it's not, it's not my, that's not the way I approach the program, but that's okay. You know, and I love these guys, so. Um, so you can do it on your own, but you do need some help. If you think you're just going to go, you know, I quit drugs forever. I'm done. I, I'm off everything. I, I'm an alcoholic and everything, but so I'm just going to quit. Well, good fucking luck to you. I really mean that. Good luck to you because you're going to need luck. You're going to need all you can get. And steps are me steps. You need to work in order and you need to work with another person. You know, you don't have to work each step with with someone, but there's the inventory step, you know, reading your inventory to somebody, you got to read your inventory to somebody. Um, it's good, it's good to go through your amends list with somebody, somebody who's done the program before you, there's a lot of cool people in there. You don't, you know, they don't talk about sponsorship in the big book. I've got a couple people that I work steps with and I, and I have nothing against working steps with anybody. You know, I'll work steps with anybody. If I got an inventory to read, I've read my inventory as somebody who's not even sober right now. There's, I think she had like 30 or 40 days, 50 days sober when I read my an inventory to her when I was on the way to, uh, to my son's funeral. So, um, it's a great thing, man. Other things that this head's going to tell you. So it's going to tell you, don't go to meetings. I, yeah, I've tried those and you know, you're going to have some fucking negative pitch or spin to put on it because your head doesn't want you to go there. And I'm hitting this hard because that's what it does. I don't need those people. I'm different. I don't need that. I'm not that bad. 
I don't have seven drunk drivings. That guy had seven drunk drivings. I'll tell you what, I only have one drunk driving, and I'm a fucking drunk. I had one drunk driving when I was under 18. So, and it's expunged from my record. Um, you know, I didn't kill anybody drinking and driving, or I didn't, you know, I didn't wreck a car. You're going to find something to separate yourself because that's what our head does, especially an alcoholic's head, man. You know, we are terminally unique. Um, other things, you know, if you're going to quit, so make, make, make a plan, get through two weeks on the couch. 